Okay, thank you very much for coming. First off, who here has heard about Aeron? One. <laughs> Great. Hopefully I get to change your mind about that. Admittedly, it is a bit niche. As mentioned, my name's Michael Barker. I'm here to talk about high-performance distributed systems in the cloud. I've been working as a core engineer on Aeron for about three years, and I've worked for a lot of financial organizations in the past. So the big question is, if you've never heard about Aeron before, what is Aeron? Aeron is a library to create high throughput, low latency, and fault-tolerant distributed applications. And our goal with Aeron is to make it the fastest app framework in its space, regardless of whether you're running on-premise or in the cloud. I'm going to just quickly pop up a few of the customers that we have. And those of you who haven't heard of Aeron probably haven't heard of most of these. Maybe you've heard of Coinbase. But up there's things like CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, big exchange out of the US. Uh, for the RBNZ folks, Six is a reserve bank out of Switzerland. So a lot of our customers are focused on financial services, but a specific area of financial services that we call capital markets. And capital markets is that subset that's dealing with financial exchanges, brokers, trading platforms, clearance, surveillance, those types of things. And one of the main characteristics about this part of the industry is a really high demand on performance. Specifically, latency tends to be the big one, but throughput crops up as well. So this sort of gives you the idea of the sort of pressures we're under to build a high-performing application. So what am I going to cover today? What I want to do is do a very brief introduction into Aeron, describe what it is, because as we see, not many people have heard of it before. Normally, I will work with a customer and spend two days explaining it. I'm going to try and cram that into five minutes. And then I'm going to talk about some of the specific features that we've added to Aeron to make it work really, really well in a cloud environment. We can talk about multi-node distribution. This is going to be the idea of when you send a message, you can distribute it out to multiple receivers. I'm going to talk a little bit about name resolution and what a pain that can be. I'm going to dig into fault-tolerant services. And then finally, I'll do a little bit about performance and numbers and some of the commercial extensions we have as well, because they're kind of interesting too. To start off with, let's talk a little bit about Aeron. I like to think about Aeron as a stack with three main components. At the very base of the stack, we have Aeron Transport. And you have to think about Aeron Transport as a layer four protocol. It exists at the same level as TCP and UDP. But we've taken what we believe to be the best aspects of those two protocols. First off, from the UDP side, it's both unicast, so sender receiver, but also multicast. So you can go from a single sender to multiple receivers, but optimizing that using the appropriate underlying networking hardware. Second thing is UDP is message oriented. So when you send a message with UDP, you either get the whole message or none of it. That's a really useful primitive to have. That's in contrast to TCP. TCP is actually stream oriented. If you want messaging on top of that, you actually have to layer something on top of TCP to get it. But there's some cool stuff in TCP too that we've dragged through. First off, it's connection oriented. So the idea is that we actually have a relationship between a sender and a receiver that's established. Secondly, it's reliable, but it's reliable in the same sense that TCP is reliable, in that once you have set up a connection between a sender and a receiver, any interim message that are lost are redelivered. That's actually also configurable. We can drop if required. It's also ordered, so that the order that the messages go into Aeron is the same order that they come out. We also have flow control. So this is the, how we get over the problem of having a fast sender overrun a slow receiver. This is quite configurable, and we also have quite a neat feature that we can do this over multicast. And in fact, we're the only product that's actually capable of doing this. There's a bunch of reliable multicast tools in the market, ZeroMQ is one of them. You can think about ultra messaging, Tibco FTL. If you haven't heard of Aeron, you've probably never heard of some of those. But all of those, when they do multicast, are relying on static rate limiting, whereas we actually do dynamic flow control. And you've got to be configurable, because you've got to decide, am I going to run as fast as the fastest receiver, 
or the slowest one, or something in the middle. And finally, we've taken congestion control. And congestion control is about preventing a fast sender from overrunning a slow network with lots of people in it. And this is really important for people that are doing things, connections over a WAN, going on-premise to cloud, or going across regions or across availability zones, where you're starting to deal with links that are contended with other users. So it becomes very important. So the second component that layers on top of that is error on archive. And very simply, this is a mechanism to record, replay, and replicate streams of messages. This is what you would end up using if you wanted to have a full decoupling of your sender and a receiver so you don't have any back pressure between the two of them. And the final part of the stack, and what I like to th refer to as the 800-pound gorilla of Aeron, is Aeron Cluster. And this is a mechanism for building fault-tolerant services, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this later on in the talk. So let's talk about the first, first feature that we added. If you're working on-premise, and certainly if you're building a financial trading system, you've generally got really good networking hardware. Arista switches and cut-through switches and all this sort of thing, and most of them support multicast. Now, if anybody is familiar with multicast, they'll start to recognize those IP addresses up there. For those that are not, multicast, there's a specific set of address spaces in IPv4 and IPv6, and those range of addresses allow you to do some interesting things. You can subscribe to a specific address when you listen to it. The underlying networking implementation, probably in your operating system, will talk to the switch and say, this particular network connection is interested in this IP address. So then when a sender sends to that IP address on the switch, it only has to send one packet up its data link, and then the switch will multicast it out to all the interested listeners. This is really, really important in a lot of financial services applications, especially around the distribution of market data. It really helps you scale out when you're trying to you know, notify very large numbers of listeners. So this is how we kind of do it in Aeron. We have the concept of a publication and a subscription, so that's our sender and receiver. And we use a URI where we specify the endpoint where that's going. Unfortunately, none of the cloud providers provide any sort of decent multicast implementation, certainly not enough to be useful. So we had to add something else. So in Aeron, we have a concept we call multi-destination cast. So this is the ability for us to emulate multicast behavior. It doesn't scale quite as well, because we still have to have the cost of sending message, multiple messages from the sender up to the network connection. But it does give us the ability to give the same sort of API to the users. The first implementation we have is what we call manual MDC. You'll notice when we set up the publication, there's no endpoint specified. We just say it's going to be control mode manual. And then we manually add in a bunch of destinations as endpoints. And then our subscription side, those are obviously subscribing to receive those messages. This works. It's fine. It has a couple of useful applications. But it's a little bit rigid. Often what we really want is the ability for subscribers themselves to decide whether they're interested or not. So that gave us the ability to add what we call dynamic MDC. So this is where we set, in this case, we set a control mode dynamic and we specify a control address. You notice it's not an endpoint address, it's a control address. This is for messages back to a publisher. And then our subscriptions can just specify that control address themselves. And you notice it's exactly the same. So the publication is listening on that address, and as the new subscriptions come in, it adds it to the, to the group. So that's the multi-node distribution story. Let's move on to naming. And to be honest, the, Kubernetes was the place that this really kicked us a lot. Now, anybody who's worked in operations and has anything to, to do with DNS will know from an operational perspective, its failure rate is basically a mean. And anybody who's not familiar should Google for is it DNS and see what sort of result they get. But one of the interesting things about Aeron, and in contrast to a lot of other microservices type ways of communicating between things, is that we're typically dealing with long-lived connections. If you're using something like HTTP, and you're communicating between your services, you're constantly re-resolving your names when I mean, you're looking something up. You know, you might do some caching to make that efficient, but it's very common if you've got an application you may be deploying once a week, for you to have a connection that's set up and run for that entire week until the system gets restarted. 
Now, with Kubernetes pods, it's quite annoying that you specify a name for them, but when you shut them down and bring them back up again, they'll have a different IP address. This can play havoc with these sort of long-term connections. So we had to add in functionality into Aeron to track when we detected endpoints going down, normally in absence of control messages, and re-resolve them. And this was specifically for a number of Kubernetes deployments that our customers had. But in addition to this, we also figured out that DNS itself is a problem and provided a mechanism for people to plug in their own naming solutions. So we've actually added, and we've added one of our own. We call this driver naming. Aeron is broken up when you're using Aeron Transport into a client and a driver, and the driver manages the communication on the network, and the client speaks to the driver over uh, shared memory IPC. So when the driver's set up, what we've done is we've added this sort of gossip-based implementation for name resolution. So you have the concept of some bootstrap nodes, you give those some IP addresses, and then whenever you add in your new nodes, you just tell them what the bootstrap nodes are. So for example, if we've got DNC that are started up already, those are our bootstraps, start up host A, it'll go talk to BNC and tell it what its name is and what its IP address is, and it'll get their responses in return. And it'll build up its own list. When host B comes in and talks to DNC, DNC will tell it about A, and then host B will then go to tell A about itself, and A will tell it about DNC as well. And it builds up this big mesh that's also self-healing. So if you lose a node, you've still got the other nodes telling you what all the names are. And this is sort of how many gossip-style protocols work. And this scales reasonably well. Um, once you get to about hundreds of nodes, it doesn't work so well. Most of our deployments for customers where they're doing this sort of thing are in the tens of nodes. So that brings me to the end of the, the naming bit. Now I want to talk about fault-tolerant services. And this is probably the biggest part of Aeron, and this is what the majority of our customers are paying support for. So one of the things about building fault-tolerant services using Aeron is that you need to change your programming model. And this is a big hurdle for a lot of people. If you've built standard applications where you have some sort of front end, then maybe a middle tier where you have your business logic, and then you have some sort of data store. You get your fault tolerance by pushing all of your state down to the database. This means you can lose your front end nodes, you can lose your middle tier nodes, and you're relying on the implementation of the database to provide your fault tolerance. So the idea is that's clustered or something like that. We do something very different, because that sort of model is simply not fast enough for the types of customers we're dealing with. Having that distance or that latency between your application logic and your state tends to make things too slow. So what we want to do is have the application logic and the state in the same process, in the same memory space, to give us those latency benefits. Fortunately, there's a lot of academic theory behind systems that are built this way. And it's built using the concept of replicated state machines. And this is not a new concept at all. This particular paper, which is a survey paper, it talks about some of the ideas of using state machines for fault tolerance systems, but it's basically surveying a lot of the history that's there. This was produced in the proceedings of the ACM in 1990. So this was five years before I went to university, and I'm kind of old now. So, so what, is, or what do I mean by replicated state machines? What makes one up? Well, there's three aspects to a replicated state machine. First off, you've got state variables. This is the data for your application. This could be as simple as a counter, or it could be as expansive as a set of order books in exchange, the set of live auctions in Trade Me, or a bunch of accounts in a broker. Second thing you need is an ordered, persistent log of commands. Third thing you need is a suite of deterministic logic to apply those commands to the set of state variables. And the really important term there is deterministic. Because once it's deterministic, that's what drives your fault tolerance. Because if you have a known initial state and you apply the same set of commands deterministically, you will have the same end state. So if you imagine a system that started up processing messages crashes, go back to your initial state, which may be all nulls or all empties, replay your suite of messages, you'll be back to where you were. So you're able to recover. If you need data redundancy, 
you copy the log to another machine, start it in the same initial state, and then you've got the same state on multiple machines. There's some optimizations here in terms of if you don't really want to replay the entire history of your application, you can take snapshots, which are just copies of your state variables, at a specific position in the log, and can just re replay from there onwards. What's really useful about this? Turns out there's also a lot of academic theory based around the idea of replicating a log for a replicated state machine. Good example is Raft. This is precisely what Raft does. And it's not the only one. You could look at things like view stamp replication, Paxos, Zab, which is used by Zookeeper. And they are all fundamentally based around this idea. And this is what makes Aeron, a, Aeron Cluster a really unique product, is that we are able to give applications the reliability of a consensus protocol like Rust to your actual, actual application itself. There are a number of products in the market, um, like ETCD, Kafka, a bunch of others that have Raft implementations inside them, but they're largely managing their own configuration, whereas we're actually providing Raft-style consensus and reliability for your application code. And it's quite unique, and I don't know of any other products that are actually doing this as yet. So that covers off the default tolerance services portion. And I did mention performance, and it's really hard to mention performance without giving some actual numbers. So here's a, a benchmark we did when we were comparing. This is just Aeron Transport, so we're ping-ponging messages between nodes. And it's comparing it to gRPC. So it's just found something that a lot of people tend to use. It's reasonably fast to give you an idea of the levels of performance that we're aiming for. This admittedly is run on-premise on some pretty fast networks. With the play, we've got a, two implementations of the Aeron driver, one in C, one in Java, because reasons. But you can see with those plain C and Java implementations, we're hitting around about 18 microseconds at the median, ping-ponging between machines. For doing the same thing in uh, gRPC, we're looking at about 85 microseconds, so about four times quicker. Now, you'll notice there's a couple of other measurements in there that have that dash onload. What that means is we're running on some network cards that give us the ability to sidestep the operating system. It's called kernel bypass, is the general approach. And that, you can see, is about 10 microseconds. That's the cost of the operating system in a network call. And you can see that drops the error latency from about 18 microseconds down to about 8. That's more, of a fifth, more than a 50% improvement. The same absolute value was applied to gRPC. It drops from about 85 microseconds down to about 75. And you're looking there, once you see that drop, we're nearly 10 times faster than gRPC. But where we get, where it's really important, what our customers really care about it, is the bit at the very far end of that chart, when we're talking about four nines, five nines, latency response times. So what we're doing with this test, we're actually running at a fixed throughput rate, and then just measuring the latency. And you can see once we start to get those high nines, we're, we're orders of magnitude quicker than something like gRPC. The really telling thing about this is I mentioned we had to run at a fixed throughput rate. So for Aeron, we were running at 100,000 messages per second. Problem is, we couldn't get gRPC up that high. So this is gRPC running at 25,000 messages per second. So we're at four times the throughput and significantly better latency. But this is kind of the space you play in when you are working with these sort of capital markets type applications. So moving away from comparing to other products, I want to talk a little bit about some of the additional add-ons that we have. Admittedly, these are commercial, but they are still relevant to the cloud. So the first one I want to talk about is ATS, which stands for Air on Transport Security. This is a plugin where the connections that we make are encrypted using OpenSSL. The second one is a thing called DPDK. I, I mentioned kernel bypass earlier. A lot of the cloud providers now are seeing that they want to bring more financial services applications onto the cloud. And DPDK seems to be the API of choice in that space. DPDK is interesting because you're no longer programming against your typical APIs you might see in your operating system. You're not programming with sockets and buffers and things like that. You are writing directly to the network card. You're having to deal with things like you have to write the Ethernet frame by hand. You have to write the IP header by, by hand. You have to write the UDP header by hand. You have to deal with ARP and things like that. Fortunately, when we built Aeron, we built it on top of UDP, which is a really simple protocol. 
So I've managed to, I did a lot of the development on the TPK extensions, and I did have to basically build a UDP stack for that. Fortunately, it's actually not terribly difficult. But if you look at the performance, you could say now C and Java driver, and there, I've got a couple of different size messages there. So what we're doing here is we're actually ramping up the throughput while still maintaining a two nines latency of one millisecond. So it gives an idea of sort of what our maximum limits are. And this is running cluster. So this is running three nodes. So this is a message in into three nodes, replicated, persisted, and then a message back. So with a 288 mes byte message, we're getting around about 200,000 messages per second out of C. We add in security, you see that drops a bit down to about 150,000. The interesting thing is once we start adding kernel bypass in, our C, the C version with the DPDK extension is doing a million messages per second. So we're getting like a five times throughput improvement on, you know, on the basic C driver. Interestingly, if we have the encryption extensions, which we know slow it down a bit, but then we add the kernel bypass as well, we can see encrypted with DBDK, we're still four times faster than without the kernel bypass. So it shows the sort of interesting benefits we can get. So hopefully that's brought me to the end of all the things I wanted to cover today. I mean, what I'm hoping you'll get out of this, hopefully obviously an introduction into Aeron and, and it's useful, but I'm hoping that also you might see some interesting things that'll help you solve some of the own problems that you may have working in cloud environments. If you're struggling with name resolution or performance or wanting to build more resilient services. So thank you very much, and I'll be around today if anybody has any questions.